In the name of St. Anne's of the Abbey, the Columbus School of Law and the School of Theology and Religious Studies, we welcome all of you to the 47th Annual Thomas Burden World Lecture. We're privileged to have as our speaker tonight, Professor Robert Fogelman. This won't be a very long introduction. I could lead you through his very impressive six-page curriculum three days, but there would be no less time for his time left for his talk. As for a compromise, we have given provided you a neat summary of the curriculum vitae on one of the pages of your program. Robert Kogelman is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Dallas University. From his extensive publications, we learn, for example, of his interest in integrating Catholicism with our culture. We read of his great concern about pain and stress. Even a presentation entitled, The Painful is Political, something we can all relate to, I think. Our special joy in having Professor Kogelman as our lecturer is that he can speak authoritatively about authoritatively about Father Thomas Werner Moore, the de facto founder of our community. It's in his honor, of course, that this lecture series is given. I had the honor of knowing Father Thomas, who was still superior here when I arrived. However, Professor Kogelman knows much more about what Father Thomas wrote and taught, as we will learn from his lecture. He presents this in a captivating way by relating Father Thomas' psycho psychology to sanity and the myth of the hero. Father uh, uh, Professor Kugelman has graciously agreed to uh, take questions after the lecture, and for that, please say for our re reception. And remind you that the gates of the parking garage close at 10 o'clock. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kugelman. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Thank you for being here tonight. This is an interesting room to give a talk. Given that, it's, oh, given that it's a courtroom, I guess I'm required to speak the truth. <laughs> Nothing about the truth. Is it okay if I take this? Yes. To begin, I want to express my thanks to Abbot James, Father Joseph, and the other members of the Thomas Vernon Moore Lecture Committee for the opportunity to speak this evening. I first encountered Thomas Vernon Moore over 20 years ago when I began my exploration of the history of the relationship between psychology and Catholicism. Moore, a priest, psychologist, and a psychiatrist, and a member of the faculty here between 1910 and 1947, developed an empirical psychology on Thomistic foundations. This evening, I will address some of what he said about the religious and spiritual life, stretching the limits of my own thinking, since I'm not a theologian. I hope that this journey bears fruit. Starting with psychology, though. Psychology has a distinctive characteristic. Because it informs us about ourselves, we may come to see ourselves in new ways, and when we do so, we may change our very selves. To be ourselves, we need the recognition of others, and psychology is one means for this recognition. As a result, psychology bears a special ethical challenge to base itself on an adequate conception of the human person. All too often, psychology is championing de degraded conceptions of the human person. The great psychologist Gordon Allport famously warned at the beginning of World War II that psychology's mechanistic images of human life threatened democratic institutions. 
More recent was the complaint that psychology has made heroism impossible. So said the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who objected to psychology overemphasizing the irrationality of our behavior, dwelling on our cognitive biases, reducing the adult to a grown-up child, and tempting us to doubt our motivations for action. I used to think that McIntyre overstated the case until I encountered the psychology of, of Thomas Werner Moore. For Moore, we must adjust ourselves, not only to the ordinary realities of life and work and love, but we must adjust ourselves to the supreme intelligence, as he often spoke of God. We are called to live heroic lives. Not just any heroism. For Moore, the ideal hero was the saint. On this topic, he wrote a book called Heroic Sanctity and Insanity, an introduction to the spiritual life and mental hygiene. More seamlessly woven accounts of the spiritual life that address psychological suffering and disorder in great detail. Moore was not blind to the difficulties that potential saints face. Moore examined human life in terms of its complete fulfillment, which he identified with the heroism of the saint. And reading Benedict Nienen's biography of Moore, I came away with admiration for the heroism and courage which he himself encountered, which with he himself encountered the challenges of his calls, both to the active and the contemplative life. McIntyre, it turns out, was right and wrong. Psychology now gives more attention to heroism, in line with an interest in the strength of character, after a long stretch when psychology focused on our failings and limitations. Maybe we give it too much attention. James Hillman finds the hero everywhere in psychology as an image underlying our, what he calls, normative ideals of health as balanced wholeness. Hillman's point was that we need many images for the soul, and the hero is just one of them. However, we do need to honor the heroic, and also to recognize that there are many images of the hero. Heroes provide exemplars for how to pursue, pursue our aspirations, how to deal with crises, how to face our mortality. Identification with our heroes is one way we quell death concerns, writes one. The hero, to borrow a phrase from Joseph Campbell, is a myth to live by. The myth of the hero has drawn the attention of many a psychologist, including Carl Jung, Eric Neumann, and Otto Rank. In Neumann's book, The Origins and History of Consciousness, the hero symbolized the development of consciousness in the life of the individual, as well as in the history of mankind. I want to borrow just a bit of what Neumann says about the hero to help us to understand more. In one pattern of heroic narratives, Neumann wrote, the hero must vanquish the dragon and thereby gain, thereby gain the treasure. The dragon swallows or threatens to swallow the hero, and one pattern of their fight is imaged as the setting and rising of the sun. And Neumann says this, the night sea journey, when the sun hero journeys through the underworld and must survive the fight with the dragon, and the new sun is kindled, and the hero conquers the darkness." Unquote. In this myth, the hero is imaged as the sun, who overcomes the dragon of darkness, thereby making life, the treasure, possible. Not just life, the treasure is the pearl of great price, the water of life, the herb of immortality. For good reason do we celebrate the birth of Christ around the winter solstice. Returning to more. Christ is the sun, the light that came into the world. Our lives in Christian terms imitate the life of Christ. Many are the paths of this imitation, the heroic being just one of them. Not just one of them, but a central one. Recall the hymn, To Jesus Christ Our Sovereign King, which I will not try to sing. With, if it's with its refrain, Christ Jesus Victor, Christ Jesus Ruler, Christ Jesus Lord and Redeemer, Jesus the Hero, the archetype of our lives. Moore wrote heroic sanctity in the late 1950s, but as early as 1917, in the psychology classes, he had been teaching saintliness as the goal of human development. Paul Hanley Furfey, who articulated the theology behind the Catholic worker movement and who blended scientific inquiry to human suffering, 
with a clarion call to conversion and holiness, studied with Moore in 1917-18, and was inspired by Moore's teaching on sanctity, theme recurred in other works of Moore's over the decades. Heroic sanctity and insanity does what few psychological texts do, deal with sainthood. It has three parts, the heroic virtues of the saints, mental disorder and sanctity at its therapeutic level, and nature and grace in the making of a saint. In order to understand Moore's conception of the heroic life, we will address his interpretation of the gospel admonition to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we will contrast two heroic soldier poets from the First World War, Joyce Kilmer and Wilfred Owen. So the hero. The church since the earliest time has recognized that some of the dead could be recognized as being in heaven, but only in the 17th century was that authority to canonize limited to the Pope. In the 18th century, Propero Lambertini, in his book, The Beatification and Canonization of the Servants of God, written before he became Pope Benedict XIV, codified the canonization proceedings of the church. A portion of Benedict's text was translated into English in 1850 as heroic virtue. Benedict's work guided the canonization process until 1983, when Pope John II issued Divine Teacher and Model of Perfection, which still identified heroic virtue as a characteristic of the saint. Moore's heroic sanctity and insanity drew extensively on Benedict's book, Heroic Virtue. The hero was a central figure in Greek and Roman mythology. St. Augustine baptized the term hero metaphorically as a name for, this is Augustine, a name for martyrs. If the ordinary language of the church allowed it, we might more elegantly call these men our heroes. For this name is said to be derived from Juno, who in Greek is called Hera. And these fables mystically signify that Juno was mistress of the air, which they supposed to be inhabited by demons and the heroes, understanding by heroes the souls of the well-deserving dead. But for quite an opposite reason, we, sh we, could, we would call our martyrs heroes, because they conquered these demons or powers of the air, and among them Juno herself. Our heroes overcame Hera by divine virtues. So the original Christian hero was a martyr, a warrior slain for refusing to worship the gods or the emperor. God called these martyr heroes to their labors to confront the dragon of the empire. Heracles, the hero of heroes in the ancient world, was the glory of Hera, and after his death he joined the community of the gods. Martyrs, Christian heroes, came to their eternal reward, the ultimate treasure after death. In facing execution, the dragon was paradoxically overcome. The hero is a cut above the rest of us. As Benedict XIV wrote, some rise above the level of the common crowd and are distinguished by great and supernatural gifts. Many are called and few are chosen. They are, though these are they who are, in a special sense, servants of God, who withdrawing themselves from all created things, give themselves up wholly to leading a supernatural life. They are marked out from the rest of their fellow Christians as distinctly as the great men of the world are marked out from the crowd that surrounds them. So the Christian hero conquers Juno, the dragon, by a life of virtue. Moore tells us that a saint must have practiced some virtues heroically. He discussed the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and the four moral check virtues of prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice. I will address here only the theological virtues. Moore defined faith with St. Paul's words, the substance of things hoped for, and he called the words of the thief crucified with Christ, Lord, remember me when thou shalt come into your, thy kingdom, as the most heroic act of faith in all the history of Christianity. Moore defined hope as the, an abiding habit of the will by which one tends to seek and look forward to union with God for all eternity. Hope is born of faith, and its fruits are love and charity. Heroic, heroic hope happens 
when, quote, with God's help, you have freed yourself from all earthly desires and have no longer any interest except in God and what he wants you to do, want you to do in your life, unquote. This heavenly desire can be painful. More quote of St. Teresa of Avila, for whom the pain of separation from Christ in heaven was such that, quote, and I think this is a quote from St. Teresa, it sometimes happens that when a person is in that state and has such yearnings to die because the pain is more than she can bear, that her soul seems to be on the very point of leaving her body, she is really afraid and would like her distress to be alleviated, lest she should in, should in fact die. Teresa understood that this fear is from natural weakness, so the hero reckoned with the dragon of anxiety in the face of death. Teresa, the hero, however, felt the pain of sep being separated from the Lord, a pain of the soul, more intensely than the fear of death. And the experience of being on the point of death was one she called overwhelming joy and delight. Such is heroic hope. Charity is friendship between man and God, more wrote, following Aquinas, and, the hero and heroic charity lacks all self-seeking and all serious sinfulness. A vivid example of heroic faith, hope, and charity is Mary's yes to the angel. Because heroic sanctity is the perfection of the human person, we turn to more what more had to say about personality. Unsatisfied with psychology's conception of it, he proposed another, drawing on both scientific psychology and Thomistic philosophy. And he said this, if you conceive of man as an intellectual being, then the strength of the personality becomes the power of personality to realize high ideals and to be faithful to moral principles, unquote. Before, because we are rational creatures, we possess freedom of will. However, he says, we are not free to will or not to will our own happiness. What constitutes happiness, however, is by no means perfectly clear. It is not clear because happiness involves, quote, the management and desire of desires and impulses derived deriving to contrary ends, unquote. However, he says, there are certain courses of action which are evidently essential to happiness. So the hero journey, journeys towards a goal of perfect happiness, a pilgrim's progress. The virtues are acquired by practice. They are habits, essentially, and they are infused into us by God. The latter is the essential source of virtue. There are degrees of virtue, the highest being that those of a purified soul. And he says this of a purified soul. Years have passed since the soul commenced seriously for spiritual perfection. In all this time, the hero has remained ever the same in the sense that he has never strayed from the path of virtue. Many and severe have been the trials of life. And as the years rolled on, there was not only no complaint, but also in every trial, perfect patience, peace, joy, and humility. Finally, the peace became continuous in both joy and sorrow. And in the peace, a light shone through a veil, and the soul knew the presence of its creator. And with the light, there developed perfect emotional control. That's the end of the quote. To capture the height of the saints above the rest of us, Moore commented that, this is what got me, if a saint could come from heaven to earth and play your part for a while, he would manage with perfect peace of mind all those acute incidents, incidents in which you display so many and such undesirable emotions. So that statement here alludes to the relationship between sanctity and mental health. So the battle with the dragon. Let me pause to introduce the dragon. A mythological creature, of course, I am defining it operationally as that which the hero must vanquish. The word dragon comes from a Greek word for serpent, so that it may have been a dragon who spoke with Eve in the garden. Unless you think that dragons are simply evil, consider the red dragon of Wales, dating back a millennium or more, symbol of kingly authority and power. Consider further that the Lord God in Psalm 18 and Isaiah 30 breathes fire and has been called a dragon lord. To mix a metaphor, this dragon is the hound of heaven, a poem by Francis Thompson about which Thomas Vernamore also wrote. 
Even as the dragon is the hero's arch foe, it is his secret friend. While there are many ways to seek happiness, for more sanctity mark the true path. That path leads to our ultimate flourishing, but staying on the correct path does not come easily. Dragons lie await on the journey. Now, more nowhere refers to dragons, let me make clear, but he did envision the saintly hero as God's knight. The hero engages in combat. With what? More explained. The true measure of strength of personality is the power to do good. For it is easy to go downhill. It takes strength to climb up to the glaciers, to climb up the glaciers to the snow-capped peak. This depiction is chilling. What are, to we, what are we to make of the climb to perfection as entering a cold, icy, remote, and often arid state? Not all our drives and desires lead us to perfection. In theological terms, we are fallen persons, our integrity lost by original sin. The path to sanctity requires the subjection of emotions and sensory cravings to the domination of reason Talk more wrote, by means of the practices of an aesthetical life and the bestowal of the mystical graces, unquote. Heroic sanctity demands self-conquest. We are such stuff as dragons are made on, to paraphrase Prospero in the Tempest. The battle does not lead to stoic indifference. Emotion and desire have their place. Um, but under the sword of reason and rational will, which direct our eyes to our ultimate good. The dualism within us is not so much that of the body and the soul, but of our driving forces. In stark terms, Moore wrote this. He didn't talk about the dragon literally, but he mentions this. He says, within each of us is a hibernating beast, an unconscious personality, which can still become active unless we maintain our system of control, unquote. There is thus inner opposition to the path of sanctity. He said, the human mind is a battlefield of conflicting forces, and the rationality that recognizes God as the true source and goal must dominate our desires. Hence the iciness of asceticism more deemed essential. Mortification, a dying of the lower urges, a self-sacrifice for greater good means in one sense, a work against human nature, against the dragon. As mental health is an aspect of a flourishing life, more contended that sanctity promotes and protects mental health. Mental health and illness being, however, biopsycho, biopsychological phenomena, sanctity cannot make us immune from illness altogether. Mental illness may have predominantly a physical cause, or it may be rooted in childhood trauma, and so become the trials of suffering that a person may, fa may face. He presented St. Francis de Sales and St. Alphonsus as examples of mental illness compatible with sanctity. Despite debilitating anxiety, scrupulosity, and what he called an excessive emotional reaction to the situations of life, both men continued their work and their spiritual exercises. Of St. Alphonsus, Moore wrote, quote, the outstanding element in this picture is a warm love of God that does not waver and a faith that is not obscure, unquote. Attention to the spiritual life can fortify those facing mental illness. However, behavior where, he says, where one does not maintain normal and wholesome relations with those whom, with whom he comes in contact is incompatible with sanctity. He recounted the case of depression where a woman's emotions, quote, are reactions to a cognitive realization of the loss of her younger brother and of her broken engagement which led to a craving for sympathy that was not given, and the substitution of self-pity for the family sympathy she hoped for." Unquote. In that mood, she attempted suicide in such a way so that she could see her family around her pitying her, which they did not do. He says, there was no patient endurance of the trials of life and self-sacrifice and the willing union of the sufferings of life with the passion of Christ, essential to true sanctity. Unquote. But the hero was not the only image of saintliness. Victor White was an English Dominican priest and a contemporary of Moore. From the 1940s, he strove to synthesize Carl Jung's analytical psychology with Thomism. 
In his book, Soul and Psyche, an inquiry into the relationship of psychotherapy and religion, published a year after Moore's Heroic Sanctity and Sanity, White objected to narrow criteria for sainthood. This is from Victor White. It is perhaps unfortunate that the word saint has come to be used almost exclusively for those who have undergone a severe test in the, of the process of canonization. This very process ensues with its demand for miracles and for heroic virtue, that they are highly exceptional members of the church and by no means typical of the process of sanctification among the faithful at large. At large. While White would probably have agreed with Moore on mental health and sanctity, he did give it a different emphasis. We are not only living beings, we are dying beings, and the wholeness of personality includes infirmity and death. Being good was not a magical charm protecting us from disorder. The presence of neurosis and psychosis in the, right, in the souls of the righteous, white wrote, should therefore occasion no surprise. Disorder may be summoned to an unrealized wholeness, said white. Wholeness of personality may or may not coincide with holiness because, says Louis Bernard, a Jesuit psychoanalyst, because true holiness almost also coincides with persecution, physical and mental abuse, intense sensitivity, and a religious passion, which would, re which would resemble neurotic or even psychotic pathology." Unquote. This, certain, this statement serves to stress the steep climb that leads to holiness for some more than others. Bernard described one type of saint, those largely unknown individuals, quote, whose psychic structures are deformed and difficult, the company of the anguished, aggressive, and sensual, all those who bear an insupportable weight of determinism, unquote. Such uncanonized saints desire the love and grace of God and give love for love. Holiness and mental well-being are not synonymous, according to Bernard. In other words, rarely do we slay dragons. They are, net, they are our constant companions. Moore's particular vision of the saint as hero showed in his attitude towards war and the soldiers who fighting them. Moore has served as a psychiatrist in the U.S. Armed Forces during World War I and thereafter, from 1918 to 1919. He was familiar with contemporary psychotherapy, having completed training in psychiatry at Johns Hopkins under Adolf Meyer, one of the leading psychiatrists of the 20th century. Moore's book, Dynamic Psychology, discussed functional mental disorders such as anxiety, neurosis, and hysteria. A functional mental disorder has its origins in mental experiences, such as trauma or shock. Following Freud, Moore held that anxiety rooted in forgotten or repressed memory can cause neurosis, and that the recovery of memory is essential to a cure. His book, Dynamic Psychology, had a detailed discussion of so-called shell shock. In one case, a soldier repressed Quote, the idea of being afraid so that he was wholly unconscious of the fact that he was incapacitated because of his fear of death or personal injury, unquote. An underlying conflict between his fear of death and his desire for military glory and the honor and respect of his comrades and perhaps also a sense of duty caused the anxiety. Moore was hardly alone in seeing war neuros neuroses originating in emotional conflict. Freud did, as well as W. H. R. Rivers, a British psychologist and physician, and, and others. Another form of war neurosis originated a desire to, quote, avoid or escape an unpleasant situation, namely battle. Here, Moore came down more harshly, seeing the symptoms, such as functional paralysis, mutism, and functional seizures, as means of escape. Moore commented this, this way. To shirk is a despicable and shameful act. I cannot believe that the whining evaders of responsibility that got into the psychiatric wards in this country and in France were ever taught the moral lessons of human responsibility or had ever learned to sacrifice themselves even in little things for the welfare of others." Unquote. He said this despite knowing the horrors of trench warfare. Rivers, by contrast, found that some war experiences were too overpowering to be countered by a sense of duty. But other psychiatrists shared Moore's view. The chief psychiatric consultant for the U.S. Armed Forces in the war, Thomas W. Salmon, 
Endorsed at you, he says, it must be remembered that shell shock cases suffer from a disorder of will as well as function, and it is impossible to effect a cure if attention is directed at one at the expense of the other. And Hugh Crichton Miller, who served in the Royal, Medical, Royal Army Medical Corps, claimed that the trauma of war can produce what he called a condition which is essentially childish and infantile in its nature. Rest in bed and simple encouragement is not enough to educate a child. Progressive daily achievement is the only way whereby manhood and self-respect can be regained. Indeed, Christian Miller categorized some cases as rooted in abnormal mother dependence. So Moore was not alone in, in ascribing some war neuroses to pathological immaturity and, and, and inadequate character development. Nor was one of his treatments electrical shocks admitted delivered to the bodily site of the symptom. 35 years after dynamic psychology and heroic sanctity, he repeated his harsh view of war neuroses, now indicated that, now in adding that they were incompatible with sanctity. The various symptoms were advantage-seeking reactions to the difficulty of life. These soldiers have resolved the conflict between self-preservation and duty by escaping unconsciously into illness. The etiology of these neuroses lay in the psychological development of the individual, the outcome of which was that the soldier could evade danger that there was a moral duty to face. Then Moore asked the question, would a patient leading a good, solid, devout spiritual life be as likely to be diverted into an evasion of duty as one who might be entirely lacking in anything like a spiritual life, unquote. To answer this question, Moore discussed the ethics of war and provided an example of a devout soldier who did not shirk. For Moore, the U.S. had declared war in Germany in 1917 because of the threat Germany posed in its war of conquest. Americans had a duty to serve in the military rooted in the virtue of piety, Moore wrote, because the freedom of the world was at stake. Joyce Kilmer answered that call. Kilmer was a poet and journalist who converted to Catholicism in 1913. He is the beloved author of the poem, Trees, which you probably can all recite, most of which by heart, but I'm not gonna say. Uh, much cherished and much derided. According to one account of Kilmer, Physical and spiritual comfort were to him something approaching antithetical. In a letter to James Daly S.J., Kilmer claimed a need to have some of the conceit and sophisticated sophistication knocked out of me and long for a stern medieval confessor who would inflict real penance. He hoped that his rise in the literary world would give him an opportunity to write of and speak of his faith. Kilmer, Moore wrote, believed that the freedom of the world was at stake, and he left his wife and children to offer his life in defense of our right to serve God and live in accordance with Christian ideals. Kilmer enlisted in the U.S. Army a month after the nation declared war as a, as a private, later even turning down officer candidates for to remain with his unit. Moore wrote that, quote, complete con con consecration to divine will and the answer to his prayer to be unceasingly conscious of the divine presence presence was the source of his cool bravery on all occasions. In one of his poems, titled Prayer of a Soldier in France, Kilmer likened the torments of life on the front to the passions of Christ. And here's one line. My shoulders ache beneath my pack, lie easier cross upon his back. One commentary on the poem says, by comparing experiences of pain, Kilmer is able to connect Christ and the soldier without directly raising the issue of violence. By all accounts, Kilmer was brave. And this is a quote about his death. A fellow soldier described Kilmer. He would always be doing more than his orders called for. That is, getting, in, getting much nearer to the enemy's position than any officer would have inclined to send him. Night after night, he would lie out in no man's land crawling through barbed wires in an effort to locate enemy positions and enemy guns, and tearing his clothes to shred. The German sniper brought him down on one such mission, and he was buried in France. Kilmer died July 30, 1918, in the Second Battle of the Marne.
Kilmer's life, quote, takes the soul beyond the point where all psychiatry must end, Moore wrote, and he found Kilmer saintly. He said, it was natural and fitting that the heroic sanctity of this common soldier in France should be crowned by civic mar martyrdom on the field of battle. Kilmer epitomized this, the dragon-slaying saintly hero. That phrase, it was natural and fitting, echoes a line, however, from a poem by Wilfred Owen, a poet soldier who was killed in combat a week before the armistice, a month after he had been awarded the Military Cross for gallantry. Owen served honorably before and after his hospitalization for neurasthenia or shell shock. His poetry spurned what he called the glory, honor, might, majesty, domin domination, dominion, or power which war had acquired in the popular mind. His poem, Dulce et Decorum Est, which means it is sweet and fitting, a line taken from the Roman poet Horace, depicts a chemical warfare attack with vivid horror, concluding that if the reader had experienced that attack, this is the end of the poem, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Owen felt betrayed by the British government and by his superiors. The dragon, once again, where, one duty, where one's duty lies is not always as clear as more presented it. Where does, one duty, where does one's duty lie when one loses confidence in leadership and in the, and in the rightness of the war? Nor did Moore consider that fear is not the only emotional factor in war neuroses. So is devotion. Owen was an officer, and he had his men to shepherd through the horrors. Moore was, however, aware of the evils of war. He quoted from Kilmer's poem, The Peacemaker, written just weeks before his death in one of the most popular, widely read, and treasured poems of the war. And the lines are, who fights for freedom, goes with joyful tread to meet the fires of hell against him hurled, and has for captain him whose thorn-wreathed head smiles from the cross upon a conquered world. The soldier confronts the fires of hell. The first stanza image Christ the warrior in combat against slavery, sin, pain, war, and death. This is again from the poem. That pain may cease, he yields his flesh to pain. To banish war, he must a warrior be. He dwells in night, eternal dawn to see, and gladly dies, abundant life to gain. Moore and Kilmer stressed that the evil was over there in the enemy, and that we were with Christ. The sufferings of our troops were one with those of Christ. The image of Christ smiling from the cross upon a conquered world might have been uplifting, but it misses the trauma of the crucifixion and of Christ taking upon himself the sins of humanity. It misses, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Owen, by contrast, said that his poetry was not about heroes. He says English poetry was not yet fit to speak of them, nor was it about deeds or lands, nor, about, nor anything about honor, glory, dominion, or power except war. Did Moore's depiction of the warrior saint cast a shadow in his harsh evaluation of war neuroses as a failure to do one duties? Was Moore correct? The sanctity shield us from mental breakdown? Some research indicates that religious practices and beliefs can buffer against mental health difficulties and promote healing PTSD. The evils of war can also shatter one's religious life, so that combat is indeed spiritual combat. Soldiers and others suffering from moral wounds have witnessed evil, as we all do in a society stricken with racism, and suffer as a result. I am haunted by Owen's account called Mental Cases, with these lines. He's, it's a description of a, of a mental ward with soldiers in it. These are the men whose mind the dead have ravished, memory fingers in their hair of murders, multitudinous murders they once witnessed. Raiding sloughs of flesh, these helpless wander. These soldiers with psychological wounds are purgatorial shadows, he calls them. And the mental, mental ward was Dante-esque, infernal and purgatorial in its quality. They are in the belly of the beast still. 
What detains us is the necessity of the hero to slay the dragon. In Neumann's terms, the slaying of the dragon must occur in the development of the wholeness of personality. We are soldiers confronting an enemy, but we all need to practice mortification as we walk the path of the saint. Mortification of the flesh, the will, the intellect contends with the dragon. Only thus can the hero win the treasure, the attainment of a high, higher spirituality. In more without reference to dragons, we find the same structure. Quote, all the canonized saints have been outstanding in their practice of body, bodily austerities. He tells us that fasting as one form of mortification not only helps, quote, to repress the concupiscence of the flesh, but also makes it possible for the mind to be more freely elevated to the contemplation of higher things. Fasting, midnight rising, hair shirts, the discipline, and kindred penitential exercises, while not necessary, not necessary except as ordered by the church to attain salvation, are necessary, he said, to reach the summit of Christian perfection. It is thus possible that more was correct, and that a life of heroic sanctity provides the training that can, hate, that can help one face the fires of hell with fortitude. Now to conclude, the treasure and the dragon once again. St. Augustine applied the term hero to Christian martyrs, even extending the metaphor, saying that the martyrs conquered these demons or powers of the air and among them Juno herself. Building on Augustine, I note that Juno, or Hera, gave birth to a dragon slain, who was slain by Heracles. And today there is a video game with the character Hera Dragon. To be a hero in this sense then entails slaying powers that rage against the light. For John Cashin, Augustine's contemporary, the end of this battle against the dragon, the attainment of what, what he called purity of heart, is only the beginning of spiritual life. In the myth, the hero achieves an apotheosis. Heracles comes to reside with the gods. The Christian saint comes to reside in heaven. Even before death, however, the saint may have a foretaste of eternal life in mystical gifts of ecstasy. Even if not those treasures, more stress that the saint achieves perfect peace of mind and yearns for the presence of God, the treasure. The Christian hero diverges from the mythological hero in one important way. As St. Paul wrote, Therefore, that I might not become too elated, a thorn in the flesh was given me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weakness, in order that the power of Christ may dwell within me. Unquote. The thorn and angel of Satan. Here we have dragons seen from a different perspective. The dragon overcomes the hero, and in recognition of weakness becomes the treasure. The dragon, heretofore vilified, is a force of good, even in combat against us, against it. Moore asserted that we need to develop a philosophy of life, by which he meant a sense of the purpose of life and a body of principles to govern, to govern conduct when we hit crises. Religion con contributes to mental health as a shield and armor in times of stress, and one does expect trials and tribulations. If one is religious, one strives to align one's purpose with God's purpose, thy will be done. We do not know how what we do works God's will, as we are, Moore says, much like the rank and file of the infantry in a big battle, acting on little knowledge and much faith. So the metaphor, life is war, echoes through Moore's work. Knowing that life is a battle, quote, leads to fruitful production, to patient persistence in one's plan of life in spite of difficulties and discouragements, unquote. Hence, the way to sanctity requires that we train for the battles ahead. This training, asceticism, calls us to walk a difficult path. Recall that Augustine first proposed the idea of the martyr as a Christian hero, and asceticism as a kind of martyrdom. We have, however, Christ as our captain, as Kilmer put it. Benedict XIV elaborated the metaphor, citing John Cashin, who said, an internal war is, be is daily being waged within, within us. When once this battle is won, all things 
that are without will, will all things that are without will become weak, and all will be, be subdued by and made subject to the soldier of Christ. We have no etern external enemy to be feared, if only those powers that are within are subdued by the Spirit." Unquote. Finally, however, grit and determination were not for more the ultimate value of religious spirit, despite their importance. Beyond what mortal flesh can accomplish is the religious experience in the ordinary person, gifts from outside oneself, superior to what he calls sheer force of will and grim determination, peace and joy and consolation that seem to be produced in the mind rather than fashioned by the mind." Unquote. Above all, the, the final stage of the spiritual life is the mystical marriage of the soul with God. War is not the whole of life. Comes to us the one who says, peace be with you. That's it. I want to end sign on peace. <laughs> I have a short one and a longer one. Uh, first of all, do you plan, have any plans to publish this talk? I'd like to, but I don't know where yet. Well, I, I would sort of like to see it in print myself. Thank you. Uh, the other question is, um, in William Bunch, I think James's, the variety of religious experience, he is very hard sometimes on people who would call heroic sanctity. He speaks especially about their mortifications, even their poverty, uh, their prayer, and so forth, and seems to see them, not seem to see them, very claims them to be, um, they are the, um, Un, the, the, uh, un, unhealthy. Uh, what would you say about that? What would Thomas Vernon Moore say about that? Well, Thomas Vernon Moore would have been very critical of William James at that point. Um, but you know, James also sees the, uh, the twice-born um, person who undergoes. A realization of their own wrongness and seeks repentance. He also found that as a as a higher form of spiritual life than life than what he called the one sport. Those who don't under, undergo a kind of conversion experience. Um, see, I'm I'm a real fan of William James, so it disturbs me that he was critical of heroic virtue. Uh, although I can I can easily see that he was. But he also, even, even if he said, and I don't know that this is what you're mean, meaning, is that heroic virtue can be a sign of a mental disorder itself. He was convinced that even if somebody was mentally disturbed, it doesn't mean that what they see and say is, is not true. Not that you have to believe it, but that it wasn't, it wasn't incompatible with Seeing the, seeing the truth. I'm not answering your question very well. Okay. Uh, I find I find myself trying to establish connections between the psychology of T. B. Moore and that of Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm a big fan of Viktor Frankl's work. I often reread. Man's search for meaning when life gets to me, you know. Uh, and uh, I think that Frankel's first book that was confiscated when he went into the camps was called The Doctor and the Soul. And he was noticing in Vienna that people were going to psychiatrists when they should be going to a priest. You should be going to confession. Mm -hmm. And uh, that type of 
diagnosis of Frankel, I think, reflects the thinking of Thomas Burnham Moore, where religious faith, the development of a life of prayer, the incorporation of certain Christian virtues is of great help in dealing with many psychological problems. Yeah, I thought of Frankel too, reading, reading more, because they both stress the importance of having a purpose in life. Yeah. yeah. And that helps you through a lot of difficulties. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, first, I just want to thank you for um, your many references to heroines as well as to heroes, um, <laughs> because uh, they're, they're in our midst. And I'm thinking of uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux, who's uh, going to be a uh, feast day this weekend. Uh, the Little Flower was a heroine. Um, very much met your criteria, I think. Well, and, and Moore has a big discussion of her. And um, there's, there was a debate going on whether she was suffering from a mental disorder at all. And he says, definitely not. But that would have taken that would have been a whole different talk if I went. <laughs> That's in the third part of the book. Yeah. Although Flannery O'Connor had a different take on St. Teresa. I wanted to um, come back to uh, to Genesis and um, as well as uh, the life is a battle. Um, so the the serpent, the dragon in uh, Genesis, um, is uh, sort of taking advantage of this lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride, and Jesus comes back to us and you know, tells us the Sermon on the Mount, here are the weapons of piety to help you with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, to help you with the lust of the eyes, we have almsgiving, and lust of the flesh is fasting, and pride is um, prayer. And I just wonder, uh, Saint, uh, or rather uh, Thomas Burnham Moore, the, the psychologist, would he have looked at that clinically and said, those three are a solution to mental health issues, prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Um, yeah, how would he have thought of that as a clinician? He said, he, one of his articles, it was written in the 30s, I can't remember the title of it now. I can get it to if you want. He said, a, a psychiatrist came to him once and said, you talk about religion as being good for mental health. Well, I tried it, it didn't work. <laughs> um, so Moore says, you know, that Appealing to someone's religion, religion only makes sense if the person is religious. And then he said, you know, if it is, definitely it, it can help. Although he also, you, you know, the other side of it is that because you, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a miracle drug cure. So we can still suffer. Good people can still suffer from mental disorder of various kinds. And it doesn't mean that they're not on the path to holiness. I mean, that's that's the. Uh, uh, occasionally, I, I have, I'll have a student come to me and talk about that uh, they're feeling depressed, and they're told that they need to go to confession, not see a counselor. And, and I try going, you know, I go go to confession, but I'm still depressed. Well, it's not just it's not only it's not only a spiritual situation that the person is dealing with. Who knows why? It could be something chemical. It could be something in terms of that they need counseling for. So it's not an either or. And uh, I get a little bit antsy when students think that religion is a magic weapon that keeps them safe from all illness. You mentioned that the, the Christian hero was different from the traditional hero in an important way. Would, can you talk a little bit about that? And was that Thomas Vernon Moore's insight, or is that something you came up with? Um, must have been more. But it is that St. Paul quote, where in his weakness he is strong. That is, it's not being strong, it's, it's being, uh, the quote is, uh, I'm going to get it. It's from 2 Corinthians. I would rather boast most, most gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ may dwell within me. And the, the notion that weakness can be heroic is something very unpagan. So I think that that's, that's one of the things that distinguishes the Christian hero from, I mean, because the martyrs, they're also, 
they don't they don't slay the emperor. The emperor slays them. But still, they're they're they're, they're heroes. So it's that reversal of the meaning of weakness and and, and also of suffering that I think indicates something new with Christianity. Uh, Professor, uh, you were speaking obviously mainly on Moore's psychology. As you pointed out, he was also a medical doctor and therefore a psychiatrist. Yes. You yourself, according to the program, are a charter member of the Catholic Psychotherapy Association, and you're also a member of something called the International Society for Clinical Health Psychology. I think if we had read that and it said International Society for Clinical Health Psychotherapy, no one would have objected or been surprised. Could you speak a little bit about the boundary between psychology and psychiatry or psychology and psychotherapy? Would it be fair to say that the boundary is pretty porous and fluid or not? I, especially with psychology and psychotherapy, <clears throat> the boundaries are very porous. Psychiatry, you know, I'll have a student come to my office and say, I want to become a psych psychologist, so I have to go to medical school. So no, you don't, only if you want to become a psychiatrist, because a psychiatrist as an MD, and they do residency in, psych in psychiatry. Whereas a, psych a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist go to graduate school, but in programs in psychology or counseling, or even sometimes in education. <clears throat> I, ha I, have, I have never been a, a, a psychotherapist. I'm not, I, I, I've been an academic. One point I was tempted to uh, get the coursework necessary so I could get licensed when I was first starting out teaching. <clears throat> but I realized that would have taken all my strength and energy away from other stuff that I wanted to do. So I didn't do it. So I've been an academic my whole career. Although I have an interest in psychotherapy, and I am a member of the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. Um, but that's, I didn't join because I'm a psychotherapist. I joined because they asked me to be one of the editors to the new journal that they're trying to put together. And they didn't pick me because I'm a psychotherapist. They know that because I did, I've done some work in history. There's a, uh, a saying, uh, I think, I don't know if it's from scripture, help carry one another's burdens in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And I think, is that, where is that from? <laughs> Bear each other's burdens, bind each other's wounds, and see Help carry one another's burdens. Yeah. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. I think that when you uh, focus just on a person, say, who's struggling, I think, first of all, uh, to give the idea, to present the idea as uh, of a person struggling or suffering because of a physiological or psychological illness as being less, I think, number one, that's the wrong way to approach it. You should never look at a person as being less and saying, well, we have to make you more like me. I'm more than you. Secondly, I think that for persons who can't because of their physiological or psychological issues, can't practice asceticism, I think that if you, by taking care or nurturing in collectively with a person, either one-on-one -on -one or collectively as a group, you're practicing it for them. And so you're all, it's, it's not just an individual process, asceticism. It's collective. And so you're not only saving them, you're saving yourself, well, God's saving, but through the way you're reacting to one another. And I think that too often, A, we put people in a lower position, and then B, we don't uh, hold one, we don't um, hold up one another's burdens. What we do is we try to separate ourselves and say, that's your problem, or I don't have the energy, or you have to take care of that yourself. And I think what it does is it uh, diminishes all of us. 
And so I think that this one-on-one -on -one or saying these guys were, uh, these soldiers were just, you know, delusional or they wanted to escape because they were afraid and then putting them down, down. They're not, there's no sanctity there, he says. I think that's wrong. I think he was wrong. And I think that's the wrong way to approach it. And I think he was making a big mistake. Yeah, to say the truth, I was shocked when I, when I first encountered that. It's, it's the only place in his work that I was really taken aback. Um, the only justification for it is the fact that it was a common practice of both in the American and the British um, medical care of soldiers of shell shock. I mean, the, the alternative would be um, the military was, of course, very skeptical about psychological wounds of war altogether. And many a, many a soldier that might have been hospitalized was, was shot. So it, it was a difficult situation. But I take your point. Okay, remember we have a question. Uh, I'm curious about your dragon. Oh, good. Okay. When you paint a picture of the dragon as uh, that which is something to be uh, slain, so on. Well, I, I came across a different uh, uh, dragon in a children's book called The Reluctant Dragon, uh, in which the dragon comes to town. Uh, befriends this little boy. The people in town get up in arms and they want to kill him. And the dragon says, look, I write poetry. I'm, I'm not out to slay anybody, kill him, nothing like that. And, uh, and he, he came across as a much more uh, interesting, complex person. And the, the writer you know, plays, plays with this image. And, and I think the message was things aren't always what they seem. Uh, you shouldn't jump to conclusions that just because he's a dragon, we should kill him. Uh, it's, a, it's a delightful read. And, uh, I'm curious if you've come across anything. I, yeah, the, the, the one example of a, of a dragon that's definitely heroic is in the book, The Never-Ending Story, where there's, I forget, Aslan, no, it's not, it's not Aslan, that's the lion. Um, a luck dragon that helps the hero Bastion survived and restores the world. So you have dragons, and there's also Chinese dragons that are very positive, that are associated with the new year and prosperity and all that. But the dragon is more complex as a symbol than, than I gave it yeah. credit for. Yeah. yeah, I have one, one question. I'm, uh, and it's like, and I'm familiar with Father Moore, obviously, but I have problems with him being Freudian because I'm sure, and I understand when he was a psychiatrist and a doctor that Freud was the thing, but Freud's not the only game in town now. No. There are a number of other modalities. Uh, when I was in counseling school, I gravitated toward a doctor named Glasser. For some reason in the 60s, he seemed to be a hotbed of all sorts of new techniques popping up like Eric Byrne and things like that. But I like Glasser because Glasser said, and he really worked with Freudian idea, that uh, everyone had two needs. One need was to love and to be loved, and the other was to have a meaningful life. And I thought that was neat. I thought that was, he reworked worked the, I guess, the Lieberman uh, Rabbi from, from the, the Freudian thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I gave a speech a number of years ago on spirituality and addiction. And I, I came across a, a Washington author, and this is the only time I've ever seen this citing, and I don't know whether how much credence to give this woman, but she said that the reason why Jung broke with Freud wasn't because he realized that Freud was sort of off, but according to this woman, Jung found that psychoanalysis for people over the age of 35 didn't work. And all the people he saw come in front of him have lost what all the great religions of the world taught. And if they didn't get it back, they didn't get well. 
And that's almost this, this citing in, the, in this article I read about this woman. Um, but and I was left to wonder like, what things? God always wins, thy will not, not mine. You know, are those the things that, that lead to, to, to sort of healthy things? And one more thing on, on just as a trigger point in Jung is that Jung wrote a letter to the, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said that, like, in, in specifically in, uh, about one patient that he had seen, that Jung had seen, that he's, Jung had said that alcoholics are looking for God. And then he says, but how can this not be misunderstood in these days? And then he talks about the different ways to get the spiritual awakening. And then he says that if someone is out isolated without the protective wall of community, the devil will come for him. And I've heard of stories of people with addiction problems who did get isolated and the devil did come for them. Thank you. Did you want to think about time? Time? Oh, we, we can talk, continue talking outside here. <clears throat> yes, you can continue these questions along our social hour. Yeah. <laughs>